All right, I got to get into this. Y'all ready? Okay, we don't have this scripture on the board, but we can have it in our, in our Bibles. I want you to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 3. It said, when the clouds are full, that it's going to rain. And it says that when a tree falls, whether it falls to east to west, when a tree falls, wherever it falls, that's where it's going to lie. All right? Now, what are we going to do with that? Maybe we, right? Now, here's the thing about trees falling. Living in Texas, I've cut down some trees. We can pipe down a little bit, just a little bit. I've cut down some trees. And one of the things that you have to do when you're cutting down a tree is that you have to know where you want it to land. Okay? You don't want it to fall on a house. You don't want it to fall on the road or on a car. So you have to decide where you want it to land. And then you've got to start putting these notches into the tree so that it will head in that direction. Because once a tree starts to fall, there's no stopping it. You can't get a tree to change directions after it's on the way down. Okay, see, a lot of us, here's the parallel. A lot of us have a picture of how we want our lives to lay out. We say, I want my life to be blessed. I want to be a bigger blessing. I want to be successful with my family and my business. I want, to, I, want to, I want to move into the fullness of potential that God has available for me. We see where we want it to land, but we don't always consider the notches that we have to put in the tree to get it moving in that direction. Generosity is one of the biggest notches in the tree of your life that will get you moving in the direction It will get you moving in the direction of where you want your life to land and where God wants your life to land. See, sometimes we think generosity means we're just going to wait around. Absolutely not. God takes action. There's God actions in our action. Okay, whenever Jesus was healing people, he didn't just say, all right, just stay there. You'll be fine. No, he would tell them, hey, stretch out your hand. Go show yourself to the priests. Wash out your eyes. Little girls, stand up. Roll away the stone. God, his action starts whenever we start to move. Okay. Interesting thing. Interesting thing. Peter's in prison. People are praying for him. This is an ax. Earthquake comes and an angel comes. Prison doors open. Chains fall off. Then the angel says to Peter, put your shoes on. And put your robe on. Why has he got to do that? I mean, he just opened up the prison doors. He just had the chains fall off. Why has he got to put his own shoes on? Why couldn't the shoes come? How come the robe didn't come like a magic carpet and just whoosh? No, see, here's the, here, here's, here's the principle. Here's the truth. God will never do for you what you can do for yourself. See, it's as we start applying the principles that God has given us in his word. It's as we start exercising that generosity. It's as we start doing all that we can do that he will move it and take it beyond us into that miracle, into that breakthrough, and into that supernatural dimension. Are we okay? Say, Jason, I thought you said you had notes. All right. All right, here we go. Praise God. The message that I have today... It's called the biggest holdup. Okay? The biggest holdup. Because when it comes to generosity, when it comes to your relationship with the Lord, really, the biggest holdup that people have has to do with money. It surrounds this dimension of generosity. Now, maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for the person next to you that's struggling in this area. But I live by this principle that it's better to stay ahead than have to catch up. So for some of us, there's going to be a grace for us to get caught up today and next week, okay? We're going to be getting caught up with this generosity. For some of us, we're going to begin to look and we're going to begin to see the kind of moves that the enemy makes to try to hold us up and limit us in every area of our lives. See, if the enemy can get you to hold up at offering time, He's got that harvest being canceled on his mind. One of the greatest 
attacks on the top of the priority of the enemy is, has to do with your generosity. It has to do with your giving. Now, let me explain why. Are you ready? This is why the enemy makes this such a priority that he wants to attack your finances. Three quick reasons. You okay? Okay. Reason number one, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Right? So the enemy knows that if he can keep you uh, just paying off your debt, uh, just paying your bills, just barely being able to survive month to month, he knows that your treasure is not ever going to be into the kingdom. Therefore, your heart is going to be divided. Am I making sense? Now think about this. Your treasure, your treasure is not what you're living out of every day. See, pirates, they would go bury treasure. They would leave it somewhere. Okay? Your treasure, it has way more to do than just with your day-to-day. But some of us can't get past paying the month or just, doing, just paying our bills that we don't even have access to some treasure. It's going to break today in Jesus' name. All right. Here's another reason why the enemy is after your generosity, trying to put a stop to it. In Luke chapter 16, verse 11, it says, If you cannot be trusted with, with money, with unrighteous mammon, how can you be trusted with true riches? Okay? Which means the way that we handle our finances is informing the spirit realm of our capacity to progress in stewardship and in sonship. Let me say it again. Are we here? The way that you handle your finances, it informs the spirit realm. Because the enemy knows the Bible too, right? It is informing the entire spirit realm of your capacity to progress in your stewardship and in your sonship. The enemy knows if he's watching you and every time that money's involved that you fumble the play. Well, he says, you know what? This person, I don't have to really worry about him. You know what 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says that you and I, are, we are called to be ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. It doesn't say stewards of the money of God. It's mysteries. We get so caught up about money, but money is just God's management training program. He wants you to be stewarding the mysteries of God. The gifts and the talents of God. He wants you to be doing something mysterious in the earth. But we get caught up because of some pieces of paper with the dead presidents on them. (laughs) They're recording it, so it'll be good. I'm going to run out of time if I do. Here's another reason. Here's another reason. You cannot serve God and money. Right? You're either going to love one or hate the other cleave to one, despise the other. So the enemy is constantly trying to put that out there so that you will be divided in your affection to the Lord. So the enemy is very much concerned with you not being generous. See, just like the Lord, how he says, if there's temptation, he will always provide a way of escape. The enemy's like this. If there's promotion, he will always provide an exit ramp. And that exit ramp looks like compromise. Oh, this is going to be uncomfortable. (laughs) All right. Do you all love me? Okay. I want you to remember the time that you said that you love me. Okay. Here's the thing about the offering time, the big holdup, right? The enemy doesn't have to get you to not give in order to get you to be on that road to poverty. He just has to get you to compromise at offering time. Let me say it again. The enemy, he's not just saying, I don't want you to give at all. What it is is he says, if I can just get you to compromise, then I've already got you on the road to poverty. Well, that sounds nice. I wonder if there's some scripture for that. All right, here we go. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. It says there's one that scatters, yet increases more. And there's one that withholdeth, say withholds. There's one that, I got my King James, withholdeth. There's one that withholds 
more than is right, but it leads to poverty. See, a lot of us think that's about two people, one person who gave and one person who didn't give. That's not what it says. Both of these people gave. One of them gave generously and it, and it increases to more. One of them withheld more than was right and it tends to poverty. Are we still here? See, people ask me, Jason, can you go broke giving in the offering? I guess so. But it's not by giving too much. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. It's the word. They both gave, but one held back what was right to give. The Holy Spirit hit him and he said, no, I'm just going to give this. This is what I can afford. This is after my budget. This is what's left over. This is what I'm going to give. And that puts you on the path towards poverty. God Almighty, are you beginning to see how this, this hold up can really hold you back in every area of your life? This is good. Anything that holds you up will hold you back. The enemy, and this isn't something new either, the enemy is constantly trying to shout, hold up at offering time. Even back in the Bible, whenever, we heard about this last week, whenever, hold up, that's right. Whenever Mary brought that precious ointment, broke it over Jesus' feet, so expensive, in the middle of this offering, this extravagant offering, Judas stands up, hold up. Shouldn't this have been given to the poor? Oh, wow, Judas. Wow, you're so good. You know he was stealing. Right? And then also think about this. Whenever Jesus is talking about the gift of his life, he's telling the disciples, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, and in three days I'm going to rise. And Peter says, hold up. We're not going to do that at all. No one's doing that. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Satan. He called out right what it was. It was that spirit of hold up. And it's still alive in the earth. Wow. Woo. All right, this is good to write down. The tide of our, of our lives, the tide, T-I-D-E, the tide of our lives rises and falls on our generosity. If we limit the importance of the offering, we limit the work of the Lord on our lives. We limit the work of the Lord in our lives. And we, we limit the work of the Lord through our lives. Now, some of you are saying, Jason, that doesn't match with my theology. I don't believe that a man could limit God. Well, Psalm 78, verse 41, it says that the Israelites tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Don't let this be a limit in your life. All right? The biggest holdup. We doing okay? All right. I got to get into the three points in the parable. You okay? All right. All right. Anytime that we're talking about generosity, and, and, and as I've talked with your pastor, there is a time of transformation that is taking place here in this body of Christ, here in this church, here in this bride of Christ, right? There is something that is taking place, a transformation. And generosity is going to be part of that. It's going to be the fruit of that, but it's also the seed of it because they go together. One of the greatest transformations that we see in the word of God, as far as a group of people, is the Israelites who go from being enslaved in Egypt. They go from just being people who are making bricks so that they can eat, and then they eat so that they can make more bricks, each one just so they can do the other. They go from that so by the end of the book of Exodus, they're rich and wealthy. In fact, in Exodus chapter 36, it says that they brought free will offerings every morning for the work of the tabernacle. So much so that they said, hey, there's too much. Y'all brought too much. Now, how did these people go from having nothing, from being broke, busted and disgusted to now being able to bring too much? For the work of the Lord. Well, a transformation happened. Well, here's what kind of, it's kind of upsetting. Because from the beginning of the book, 
in chapter 1, they already desired that they would have the blessing of God. They already desired that they would have the blessing of Abraham. They already desired that they would worship God more completely. They already desired that closer intimacy with God. They already desired that they could bring him an offering. But yet a third of the way in to Exodus, they are still in Egypt. Why are they still in Egypt? They got held up. Pharaoh held them up. Okay. Let me give you a little bit of context about Pharaoh and his big holdup. Are we okay? Okay. The Israelites, they've been slaves for 400 years. They want out. God picks Moses. God says, Moses, I want you to go and negotiate the peaceful surrender of the Israelites. Now, it's not so that they can go to the promised land. That's not how it starts. The whole conversation starts with let my people go and worship. That's all it was. Now, Moses goes and says to Pharaoh, we want to go and worship. Pharaoh says, no, that's not going to happen. He refuses. He keeps all these Hebrew hostages there. Then we know that he makes life worse for the, for the Israelites. And then God makes life worse for the Egyptians with all the plagues. We okay? Making sense? What's interesting is that during the plagues, Pharaoh flip-flops on releasing them or keeping them. Okay? And it's in these flip-flops that he starts to give these compromises. He says, you can go, but this, this, this. You can go, but this, this, this. He had a holdup attached to every single compromise that he was giving them. As we look at these three things, you're going to see that this same spirit of holdup, this same Pharaoh-style church member mentality exists in the earth. That there are people who are taking the compromise, taking the compromise and staying enslaved. Because here's the thing. If Pharaoh... If Pharaoh sets the parameters of your freedom, then you're not really free, right? Okay, all right, you all right? So do you know where we're going? I'm going to give you these three compromises that Pharaoh gives. We're going to see what the biggest holdup was, okay? And then we're going to examine ourselves and say, is this where I am? Or is this something I can encourage someone else with? Praise God. Are you all right? All right. Let's look at this first compromise. Glory be to God. Let's look at Exodus chapter 8, verse 25. Are you ready? All right. It says, Then Pharaoh called uh, Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land, which will be in Egypt. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so for the offerings that we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they stone us? We must go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, hold up. Pharaoh said, I will let you go and sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far. Stay right here, plead with me. Here's compromise number one. Pharaoh says, you can go, but don't go too far. You can go, but don't go too far. You can go to church, but don't go too far into it. You can become a Christian, but don't go too far. Now, if that was all that was said, we have a great sermon already. Don't go too far, right? (laughs) Things that hold us back could be our past, right? Remember Lot's wife, right? She looked back. Oh, what could have been had she just kept pushing forward? But she was held back by holding on to the past. She didn't go too far. What about Samson? He couldn't let go of his flesh. It held him back. Had he just let go of that thing, he could have moved forward. But instead, he was held up and held back. He didn't go too far in the things of God. It's a great message. However, Moses seems to put the location of their offering as secondary. The primary reason that he refuses this compromise 
is because the offering that they were going to bring. He says, listen, Pharaoh, the offering is going to set the distance of how far we have to go. Oh, you're trying not to hear it. The offering, the offering is going to be what sets the pace for how far we go with God. Okay, now here's the thing. He gives some very, very clear things here. He says, our offerings will be an abomination to the Egyptians, and they will stone us, right? Now, why would it be an abomination to the Egyptians? I'm glad you asked. The reason is, is because the things that the Egyptians worshipped were going to be the very things that they were going to offer to God. See, any time that you take what someone else has made a God and you give it to God, you're going to have a problem. Are we still here? So Moses is trying to be nice. But here's the 2022 version. People have made money a God all over the earth. And no other offering gets the kind of hatred as does giving to the local church as does giving to the bride of Christ. Just think about this. Somebody can stand up and tell you, hey, I gave $10,000 just to help the polar bears so that they have sunscreen. Everyone says, man, this guy's generous. What a guy. I gave, I gave $20,000 so that I could help the unborn aardvarks. Oh my goodness, this guy gets it. Step right up. But then you say, I gave $50,000 at my church last weekend. I want to see the gospel go from this generation to the next generation. And they say, what's the matter with you? What about the polar bears? You've taken this Jesus thing too far. You've taken this offering thing too far. You've taken it too far. Are we okay? Now, if someone is extravagant in their wealth on themselves, it, will, it, it, it can create some tension. Someone says, how much did you pay for those shoes? I say, well, it was kind of a lot. And then there, there, there can be this unspoken resentment, right? Maybe this awkward embarrassment, like, oof. But if, when it comes to being extravagant towards God, it will demand a confrontation. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. If you're a giver. Now, for some of us, the world's just happy to be around you. They don't even notice you. Oh, my goodness. Come on, folks. Are we still here? All right, let me take this a little further. Might I suggest that the distance of how far that you have gone with God, it can be measured by your willingness to sacrifice as God directs. And might I suggest that the distance you've gone with your church can be seen and measured in your willingness to sacrifice as God directs your pastors to direct you. Y'all going to have to watch this back later and say, what was he saying? Now I get it. Now I get it. How far have you gone with God? See, we're talking about putting our money where our mouth is. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Now, some of us are also thinking this. I try to think about what you might say, right? Because it's the things that I say, too. Because I'm a human, too. So some of us might say, Jason, that's, that sounds really nice. But my tithes, my offerings, my generosity, my relationship with my things has nothing to do with my relationship with God. Nice try. But I'm not going to have it. Well, I would have to respond to you with some more scripture, Interesting, whenever John the Baptist shows up on the scene, he's the first one, he's coming and he's preaching about the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen? He tells these people, he says, look, we're going to make all the, oh, all the mountains are going to be brought low. He says, the salvation of the Lord will be seen. The smooth places, the rough places will be made smooth. All this powerful preaching. Then he baptizes them, and this is in Luke chapter 3. They say, well, what should we do now? And John says, bear fruit in accordance with repentance. 
So what does that fruit look like? They ask him, I did your homework for you. They ask him, what does it look like for us to bear fruit in accordance with repentance? And John the Baptist does not say, well, y'all should do a 24-hour worship service. Those are good, but he didn't say that. He did not say you should fast every other day for a year. That can be good, but he didn't say to do that. He didn't say you become a social influencer and do the ice bucket challenge. He didn't say that. <laughs> what he said to do is right here. It's in Scripture. Luke chapter 3, verse 11. He answered them, he who has two tunics, let him give one. To him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collector said, what about us? What can we do? Verse 13. He said to them, collect no more than what is appointed to you. In other words, don't hold people up. And he says to the soldiers the same thing. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely anyone. Be content with your wages. Nobody brought up anything about money or possessions. But it's so close to the heart of God that he couldn't talk about true repentance without talking about money and possessions. Are we okay? Okay, well, maybe that's just once. Now, Zacchaeus has a similar story. Zacchaeus comes to Jesus. One encounter, he turns around and says, I'm giving half of my money to the poor. He says, I'm going to return if I've stole. I'm going to return it four times over. And Jesus says what? Wow, what a great guy. No, Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. This man has proved that he is a son of Abraham. The reality of of Zacchaeus' soul transformation was made evident in his ability to cheerfully and willingly depart from his money and his possessions. Are you beginning to see this? Don't let people say that money is something separate. Well, it's money's over here, and our relationship with God is over here, and they're compartmentalized. Absolutely not. God looks at them in together, right? And then, of course, we got the rich young ruler. We know that didn't work out well. All right. You're already quiet. You can't get much quieter, but... It's it's going to get worse. Are you ready? Compromise number one, you can go, but don't go too far. All right, don't go too far into the things of God. That can be seen in the offering. That was a holdup. Here's compromise number two. And I'll save you some time. I'll give you the the address. It's Exodus chapter 10, verse 8 through 11. And here's the compromise. He says, y'all can go, but only the men. Just the men. The men only can go. Wow, okay. Moses says, no, absolutely not. We're all going to go. We all got to go. Us, our wives, our sons, our daughters, everybody's going. Now, what is this about men only? Right, so I like to overthink things. I really like to get into the word and say, what's going on here? Now, there's a couple of things that I pull from this. First of all, we've got a house that is divided, right? Right? So he's saying, you guys can go, but only take half the house. Now, a divided house cannot stand, right? But there's a couple levels to this. Number one, you are a house. You are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? In my Father's house are many mansions. That's you. You're a mansion. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Okay. A house divided is saying, well, I'm going to come and I'm going to give God this part of my life is going to be in worship. But this other part, this other pet sin I have over here, I'm not going to bring it in. Uh, My unforgiveness, that's different. You don't understand what happened to me. My offense, well, you don't know my situation. As if your situation speaks louder than Christ on the cross. Come on. Well, you don't understand. Okay, okay. All right. And he said, well, doesn't Jesus care about my story? Yes, he does. He cares so much that he made you a new creation. God Almighty, come on. All right, I'm having fun with you all. So a house divided is not going to stand. 
And this is a compromise people take. We can't have compartmentalized relationship with the Lord. He has to be God of all or he's not God at all. Does that make sense? Those little pet sins won't stay pet sins. We got to bring all of these things. We got to work out our salvation and bring all of these things into the truth of the word. The Bible says take every thought captive. Okay, so that's one. Here's number two. A divided house has to do with the actual family. Now, we want to be at a place. We have a family gospel. We want to be at a place where we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, it doesn't matter if your husband, your wife, your, 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 your kids, your grandkids, if they're not all involved with the things of God, but you are, they should know about it. If they're around you, they should be getting some Jesus on them. Does that make sense? And if you can, you can drag them to church. And if they're not going to come to church, you're going to pray them into church. But we, okay? But then there's another one. This one's uncomfortable. Okay. Another part of this house divided has to do with there not being the next generation. See, Pharaoh's pretty clever. Pharaoh says, y'all can go, but it's just the men. He knows that if just the men go, that's only half of the equation in order to have a harvest. Right? That's just the seed. For there to be reproduction, for there to be multiplication, that seed has got to be sown into the soil of the bride. All right? We okay? So we have this picture of Pharaoh saying, let's just have the seed over here, but it's never sown. It's not being sown. So Pharaoh's not worried. He says, you know what? Y'all just go and have your seed, but don't sow it and it'll be fine. That's my compromise. They said, no, absolutely not. We have to sow the seed. See, this mentality of men only, this mentality exists in men and women all over the world today. And their thought process is, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to enjoy the worship. I'm going to come to church and I'm going to enjoy the preaching. I'm going to come to service and just tolerate Jason while he's preaching. I'm going to come to service and sing and shout. But when it's offering time, that's when I'm going to hold up. It's about, to get, it's about to get worse. Make it worse. All right. Genesis chapter 38. Let's see how God processes this seed not being sown. Genesis chapter 38 verse 6. It says, and Judah. Are we reading this? All right. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife, that he spilled the seed on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And, he, and the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he slew him also." What we're seeing is that people want to come to church with this owning mentality. They want to come to church and press in at the worship. They want to press in at the preaching. They want to press in at the fellowship. But when it's offering time, when it's time to put in, they pull out. Whenever it's time for them to put seed in, they say, hold up. I'm not putting seed in at all. They want the church experience without the scriptural responsibility. They want the experience without the responsibility. Say, so get rid of it. We don't want this owning spirit anymore. God Almighty. Now, maybe you're saying, Jason, that's a reach. But watch this. The very next plague that God sends, the very next plague that God sends is the locust which destroys all of the harvest that the Egyptians had. He knew if you're just taking the men, you're canceling their harvest because that seed is never going to be sown. So therefore, I'm taking your whole harvest. God. 
God Almighty. Are we learning anything? Remember, you said you love me already, right? That was back then, though. That was back then. So the first one was you can go, right, but don't go too far. Had everything to do with the offering. It was the holdup that kept them from moving. The second holdup was you can go, but just the men. So just keep your seed and don't sow it. The third one, Pharaoh's not hiding the ball at all. He comes right out and says it. This is in Exodus chapter 10, verse 24 through 26. And Pharaoh tells him, he says, you can go, but you cannot bring your offering. He says, don't bring any of your flocks. Don't bring anything that you could offer to God. See, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's clever because he knows if they're not giving, that there won't be any increase. Let me show you all a picture. You want to see a picture? Okay. We have a picture of a map. Let's see. Hopefully we have a picture of a map. We have a picture of a... Hey, okay. What we have down here is the Dead Sea, right? No life can grow there, right? Okay. Where does this water come from? What's going on here? We just got water that's dead? That doesn't make sense. I'm glad you asked. That's why I'm here. I did your homework. Okay. This water starts all the way up here at Mount Hermon. So Mount Hermon has these snow cover. It's a snow-covered cap on it. And when that water melts, it comes down and it pours into the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee has fish. It's got life. This is where Peter, Andrew, James, and John, this is where they're fishing, right? So the water comes in from Mount Hermon, and then it comes into the Sea of Galilee, and then the Sea of Galilee releases it, and this right here is the Jordan River. I don't know what all this is, but this is the Jordan River. The Jordan River is where Jesus was baptized, right? There's life in the Jordan River. So the Jordan River, it receives water in from the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River releases the water into the Dead Sea. But the thing is, the Dead Sea, it doesn't have any outlets. So that water comes in, and that sun bakes it up, and it evaporates, and that salt content just keeps growing and growing and growing. Because the Dead Sea, no, it knows how to receive, but it doesn't know how to release. It knows how to beg, but it doesn't know how to bless. Are you still here? It knows how to get, but not how to give. And if you just know how to receive, but not how to release, what God gives you with life in it will turn to death just like that. Pharaoh knew that. He said, if these guys are out there, if these jokers go out there and worship, but they don't have anything that they're going to bring to God, well, then it's going to be over before sundown. Isn't it crazy that even Pharaoh recognized the importance of the offering? My goodness. I told you, Pat. I said, Pastor, I don't know if I said I hadn't shared this one. We'll see what happens. Nobody's ran out yet so that, or ran up, so that's good. <laughs> All right. Let, let, let me give you a couple of things here as we're closing about the, about the offering. The enemy wants to attack that generosity because he doesn't want us to have a harvest. And we know about the seed time and harvest. I, I've talked about it, prophetess, bishop, we've talked about that. But there's another dimension to not having abundance in your life. It has to do with credibility. Can you say Credibility. See, it's awkward that we walk around and say that we have a good father who loves us and that God is our Jehovah Jireh and that he loves us, but then we're just barely getting our needs met every month. Check, okay, take a look at this. Take a look at Ecclesiastes 
chapter 9, verse 16. This is the word of God. It's in your Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 16. It says, then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. We're talking to people about how great our God is. But we're struggling to get by in so many different areas. See, it's, it's an attack of the enemy. Um, even with, uh, with, with the Catholic Church, there was a season where they had to all take a vow of poverty. Remember that? You heard about this? If you're going to be one of, the, uh, one of the fathers, one of the ministers, you had to take a vow of poverty so that you would be more credible. But that goes directly against what the word of God says. It says nobody listens to the poor. That your wisdom is despised. God wants you to have more than enough. And it happens through giving. And it happens through not compromising when it's time to give. That's when it happens. Now, this is, maybe this is for you, maybe it's not. But the word of God tells us this in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. It says, he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. It's my last verse. Sometimes we have this mentality that, that there's the work of God that's going on, expanding the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, right? And then we have over here this resistance, those that are pushing against what we're trying to do in bringing the kingdom, okay? And then there's some of us in the middle who are just kind of lazy about it, but in our mind, we're thinking, well, if I'm not against him, I'm, I'm, I'm for him, right? Well, here's the thing. If you're struggling all the time, if you're being lazy in your work, and that's not talking about punching out early at work. That's talking about your work with God, your work, your kingdom work. The work of seed time and harvest. The work of walking in purity. The work of walking in integrity. The work of walking in obedience. If we're being lazy in that, we have more in common. We are closer akin to those that are working actively and resisting the kingdom of God than we are the actual kingdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're not doing God any favors by living like sinners and then showing up on Sunday or putting on our profile that we're a Christian. We're not doing God any favors. Oh, my goodness. All right. All right. That's why the offering has got to be something that you not. It's not just something that we do every week out of a ritual. It's something that we do out of a revelation for what it is. God wants to equip his children so that you have more than enough. He wants to equip his children for the credibility of the gospel so that your words would be heard. He wants to equip you with more than enough. But if we are always compromising when it comes to the offering, we are sending ourselves down that road towards insufficiency. And the whole time we're going... We're singing, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye. I love you. All right, I love you. I'm your friend. Okay? The biggest holdup, I believe the biggest holdup that is keeping the kingdom from expanding, it's keeping us from stretching out our tents, the thing that is keeping us contained has everything to do with the offering. When we come to God with an open heart and we say, God, search me, have your way with me, do whatever you want me to do, tell me whatever you want me to do and I'll do it. When we come to God like that, it's powerful. But the scripture says that where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. So we can't have that thing and then ignore the other thing. Amen. All right. Here's what I want to do. We've already had our time of tithes, but I feel like giving. <laughs> so I'm going to give. I'm going to sow some seed. I don't want my seed not being sown into the bride, the bride of Christ. Come on, y'all, the church. So at this time, 
I mean, look, we got no music. This is just, this is just anointing, no spices. Okay? What is the Holy Spirit telling you to do right now? It's easier to stay ahead than it is to catch up. So maybe you hadn't realized all of these different compromises were at work in the earth. But the enemy is very aware of it. He's watching how you handle your finances, and he's looking for every opportunity to discredit you. But here's the thing. The enemy, he's got no power compared to our God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? So at this time, I know that we do a lot of giving online. Pastor, how do we want to do this? Do we want to have people come forward or just give online? All right, let's, we can give through our devices, okay? If you have something, you can bring it down. If you want to give through your device, you can do that at this time too. But I want this to be a significant seed and a, something that's precious to you, okay? Now, if, if I came and I talked about salvation, it would be wrong to just walk off, right? Not give you an opportunity to respond. If I talked about healing, it would be wrong if I just walked off. So we're not, well, that's all. Well, we've talked about sowing. And we've talked about having a new understanding about it. So I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Are we still friends? <laughs> All right. So, Pastor, would you come at this time? <laughs> 